Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about depth conversion using seismic velocity functions. So we've got a plot here of uh, velocity uh, versus depth and a polynomial function. So I'll talk about both those two functions, their pitfalls and their advantages. So first of all, why depth convert? Well, seismic data is recorded in the time domain. Basically, it's the time taken by a sound wave to go to the reflector, to the target reflector, and then come back up again. So that's two-way time. Now, that has obviously quite a lot of uses. You get a nice image, but if you want to do anything with it, like plan a well, drill a well, uh, calculate reserves, etc., you need that in depth. So you need to come here. And the way you do that is by using this thing here called the velocity model. Different ways of doing that, uh, some complicated, some simple. So what we have here is a graph of different seismic velocity methods. So the ones I'm going to talk about are the ones in green, which are the V0K and other functions, both single layer, multi layer, and then also a little bit about stochastic uh, functions. Um, although I have a separate video on stochastic depth conversion uh, modeling one on my playlist. So initially start off with apparent average velocities, which is very simple. Then you go to layer cakes, which are multiple layers. And then you go to uh, V0K functions. You can also use things like the velocity models, or you can use seismic velocities. Um, so that's the deterministic. So that gives you a single answer. And then you have stochastic, which you can also use velocities for stochastics. Now, generally, what tends to happen is that methods going in this direction are more complicated, take more time, they're more difficult. You may need specialist software. You may need to outsource it to a specialist contractor to do it. So um, you obviously need to choose the right uh, function for the right result. So what do you look to, to make your choice? Well, first of all, there's what data do you have? Um, do you have any wells? If you're in a frontier area with no wells, that obviously is a little bit harder. Or if you only have one well and you have to try to extrapolate from that. And what data do the wells have? Do they have check shots? Do they have VSB? Do they have sonic logs, etc.? Uh, what seismic velocities do you have? Now, it's all very nice if you've got one survey, which has been processed by one company. If you've got a full waveform version, um, velocity model that's absolutely marvelous unfortunately real life isn't always like that uh, if you have multiple surveys using seismic velocities might be a bit difficult but we i do have a workaround for that as well and uh, again what's the geological complexity how complex is your geology what are the layers like what are the lateral and vertical variabilities like if you've got a very simple um, everything increases in, with depth like in a, in a tertiary delta or uh, gulf of mexico that's one thing if you've got something really relatively complicated with salt, carbonates, etc., a bit harder. And then what do you need to achieve? You look at a prospect, you look at field volumetrics, you're planning a well. Uh, what's the scale of decision needs to be made? And what's the time frame available? So use all of that to try to make a decision as to which one of these you're going to use. So if you look at um, complex geology, so this is from the Southern Gas Basin and uh, uh, just off the coast of uh, eastern coast of England, between England and Netherlands. Uh, so you've got tertiary, upper Cretaceous chalk, which is very fast, a lot faster than a tertiary. Then you slow down a bit for the lower Cretaceous, mild clay and siltstone. Then you've got the Triassic, which is uh, upper Triassic, which is uh, clay and hydrite. There's thin halides within that as well. Then you've got lower Triassic, which is sandstone and claystone. Then you've got the Zechstein, which is split into two uh, units by the platinum dolomite, uh, major dolomite layer. So above that, you've got... Um, mainly halite, some on hydrite, a bit of clay, a bit of siltstone, highly variable, it's complicated. And below that, you've got uh, much faster velocities, you've got dolomite and hydrite, local pods of halite. Again, you've got to get here to the Rotley and Permian target. So again, that's a complicated one. It's probably the most complicated you're going to get. Um, but you need to understand what that is, so you need to build a diagram like that to figure out what you need to do. Okay, so what's a velocity function? So it's a formula that relates to velocity or goes to the depth directly to another property which can be seismically mapped. For example, two-way travel time. And the two basic types of function. There's a formula that you can apply universally to interpret the data set. Then you tie the wells at the latest stage to use one size fits all and then you fit later. Or you do lateral variations where a component of the function is mapped over interpreted area, either by computer grazing or by hand contrary, depending on what you're doing. And you can use velocity functions directly for one layer or as part of a multi-layer scheme. So the whole velocity functions uh, basically go on the effect of compaction. So sedimentary rocks lose porosities that buried. So basically the holes get squished. There's also some diagenetic processes such as cementation, which again increase the hardness of the rock, increase the velocity. And 
you might get compaction slowed, but if you have uh, overpressure fluids contained in the pores, so if you've got enormously low velocities, that indicates that you've got overpressure. Again, used for pressure prediction. And there's, there's the Wiley equation here. 1 over V equals velocity over V fluid, 1 minus velocity over V matrix. And some areas, you've got some rock types that have quite distinctive compaction velocity increases with depth. However, this isn't quite universal because there's some rocks, for example, halite, uh, very hard dolomites that have got no porosity. They basically don't compact because they don't have any pores to compact to compact at all. They have quite diagnostic velocities, for example, halite does. Um, so again, you can do this sort of plot here where you've got velocity, kilometers per second or feet per second versus depth. So as part of that, you have some understanding of where things are. So a little bit of uh, velocity definition. So this is time, this is depth. So velocity is the rate of change in the, of time to depth. So here you have a gradient, then you have V interval, then you have V instantaneous. So the average velocity is the velocity from uh, the datum to the target horizon. The instantaneous velocity is the speed of uh, sound in the rock at a specific point in time. Interval velocity is the average velocity for that particular interval. V0 is what the velocity of the rock would be at, um, at datum. And velocity gradients, the rate of change of velocity, basically the acceleration. So that gives you the velocity uh, gradients and velocity definition. So you can put a velocity time depth plot for a well. So this is a, a sonic log and a check shot corrected sonic log. Frequencies for uh, sonic logs and frequencies for seismic data are slightly different, so you need to correct them using a check shot. So effectively what you have here is this uh, plot where that's time, that's depth, and basically the gradient of that line is velocity. So there are different types of velocity function that exist. Uh, I'm going to talk about V0 K and polynomials. There are others. There's the force function, which is used quite a lot in the Gulf of Mexico. It was invented by Dr. Faust in the, um, in the 1950s. Midpoint depth functions. They're quite popular in some areas. Velocity versus time functions. And isochron isochronical functions, which are quite popular in the Southern North Sea. I never really used to see them used anywhere else. But V0K is the most popular one of polynomials used in some areas as well. So what is V0K? So you've got a velocity versus depth, or time for that matter. So V0 is the velocity at the datum. So when you decompact the rock, you'll end up here. And K is the, is the increase in velocity with depth. Um, typically, one of the, you keep one of these constant, usually K, and you vary V0. So Z equals V0 plus K star Z. And when you um, calculate it out into depth, depth equals V0 divided by K, uh, star to the exponential k star t minus one now don't worry about the formulas because a lot of the software has all these things built in you just plug in your k and you plug in your v0 and everything's taken care of uh, v0 you generally tend to calculate from the seismic datum but in deep water areas it's probably best taken from uh, seabed because water has its own set of uh, set of uh, velocities and then you can back out the resultant velocity uh, from the uh, from the depth maps or quality control and most of the software will uh, will allow you to do all of that. Uh, quite useful to have um, clips, so basically you don't get runaway velocities using exponentials. You can also have different V zeros for different layers. So this is an example here with velocity, and that's depth below datum. And you have layer A, layer B, layer C, and layer D, all of which have got slightly different V zeros, different Ks. So this is how you would do it in a multi-layer situation can also use V0s in a situation where you've got multiple seismic velocities, but they're kind of a bit um, fuzzy because you've got different surveys, they've been processed by different people, and they don't really add up. But what you can do is you can uh, back out uh, time depth pairs from those velocity sets from these individual velocity analysis, uh, cross plot them in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet, and from there you can get V0 and K and you can get a smoother map, which takes out the uh, variability of the different processes. So again, you've got one or two wells in an area with multiple seismic surveys. This is a potential solution to that particular problem. So the workflow for V0 and K is you get your uh, sonic logs, you plot your variables, get you v0 and k now there's some software packages um, particularly velet that allows you to do all of that so you don't have to export it out to spreadsheet calculate v0 for specific wells produce v0 map produce a layer thickness map and then 
you can create backed out velocity maps, do various corrections, etc., to do the quality control to see what it looks like, and then you end up with a final depth map. In a stochastic depth conversion, what you effectively do is you do your uh, B0 map in a stochastic way. So instead of having a single deterministic uh, realization, you'll have your variograms, you'll have your uh, nuggets, etc., and you'll produce a different set of a set of maps, a set of realizations of the B0 map, and that's where you will get your stochastic uh, figure from. Moving on to polynomial functions, um, again, these are popular in some areas, particularly in tertiary deltas. So you've got uh, depth and time, and basically um, velocity increases with time, but also accelerates. So you've got this formula here, z equals a to the t uh, squared plus b to the t. So effectively, you can uh, calculate that from a, from a spreadsheet. Now, the pros are uh, quite simple to, to use. Because uh, you can have one function, then you do a correction grid to fit the wells. Um, you don't really need any fancy software, but uh, only really simple for areas simple overburden. So tertiary deltas, for example, Nigeria, Gulf of Mexico, etc., where you, you know how things behave. Uh, it'll break down in areas of anomalous velocity. So if you have a locally overpressured zone that's quite significant in an area, it'll break down because you, the function won't work there. And you can also because of the exponential can get runaway effects. So it's, it's always useful to create a backed out uh, velocity grid just to make sure that it all works and make sure that it all looks sensible. And if the uh, grid starts running away, you can clip it to ensure that things do. And again, uh, software packages will have this sort of polynomial function built in. So you just plug in the numbers and uh, you will get your result. But please do QC it because uh, relying blindly on what software packages do for you is not really a good idea. So just to sum up, the velocity functions relate rocks to uh, of velo velocities of rocks to depth of burial. They use well data, sonic logs and check shots are important. You can be single or multi-layered, so it depends on the geological complexity. And obviously, you can use within your method. If there's some layers, for example, you have a layer of halide, you can put a fixed salt velocity in for that. You don't you obviously functions won't work in that sort of situation. You can work in both classic and carbonate settings, particularly something like chalks, which have a, um, a fairly well-defined um, increase of velocity with burial and the two components. So there's a depth of burial, such for example, K gradient and the residual, which varies laterally, so example, V0. Relatively quickly to use the formula built into most mapping software, so Bequel, Equipoises, Velet, Doug, Kingdom, they've all got them. So fairly easy to use there, but please do use the QCs. And you can use it also as part of the stochastic workflow where you vary the, the V0 effectively. And you still need to extrapolate outside well control. So I have a video using how to, talking about how to extrapolate and how that works. So please watch that one. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.